Fish, good morning. Penny, good morning. Tony Lee, good morning. Christy, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and we shall be glad in it. Amen. Good morning, Candace. Amen. Tasha, good morning. Shanika, good morning. Amen. Listen, why don't you find someone that's on live with us this morning and bless them. Encourage them in the Lord this morning. Speak the blessings of God over their life this morning. Amen. Amen. the Lord this morning? How many of you are desperate? Desperate for his love. Okay, good morning. Desperate for his power. Desperate for his presence. Amen. Pastor T, good morning. This, this, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Listen, even the devil, before he can get busy and do what he's going to do today, even the devil has to wait for God to make the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And because God has made it, we have a right to rejoice and we have a right to be glad in it. 
Amen. Good morning, Pastor Pam. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the name of the Most High God, maker of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this morning. We are invigorated by your presence. Our passion, our passion, our passion, our passion. Hallelujah. Our passion is here for you this morning, oh God. We're on fire for you, Lord God. You have done great things. We are in awe of your majesty. We are in awe of your love. We are in awe of your care and your tender touch. God, our desire this morning is to draw closer to you. Bring us into your loving arms. Open us up to your presence, to your power, and to your provision this morning. We acknowledge, oh God, we are grateful for what you did on Calvary's cross. We don't take it for granted the blood that was shed. God, we come before you humbly, for we know that no flesh can glory in your presence. We stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, knowing that our sins are forgiven. There is triumph over our trespasses and our transgressions. Only because of the blood of Jesus. All of our waywardness, our backwardness, our iniquities over 2,000 years ago was nailed to an old rugged cross. And for that we say thank you, Lord Jesus. And God, we are we are in awe. We are baffled by your grace and by your mercy. How even after the greatest act of service, the greatest act of love that any man can show towards another human being, God, you did not stop there. Oh no, after Calvary's cross, three days were you in the grave, triumphing victoriously over the devil. It was your inauguration. How you stormed through hell. You dismantled and disabled all powers of darkness. For it was you, Jesus, who went and snatched the keys to death, hell, and the grave. So the songwriter can say, Oh, grave, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? For our God and our King, He is God all by Himself. And it was you, Jesus, after you had marched through the flames and fire of eternal damnation, you walked and led captivity captive with the, the Old Testament saints walking behind you into glory. You are mindful of every single human being, every single person that looked forward to your glorious appearing. And Jesus, you did not stop there. For it was Paul who said that you are seated on the right hand of the majesty on high and that you are daily making intercession for us. You are praying to the Father. Praying to our Father for the sustaining of our life. It is you daily, Jesus, who are praying for our victory. You are praying for our health. You are praying for our welfare. You are always thinking of us. And what is man that you are mindful of him? The, the son of man that, that you care for him. It was Matthew who said in chapter 10 and verse 30, for the very hairs of our head are all numbered. You don't allow one to fall to the ground without you knowing. God, you are a, a God of detail. You care about every intricate detail of our life. Even though you challenge us, oh God, you still continue to chasten us. 
even though you challenge us, oh God, it's in you that we will be glorified. Even though you chasten us, oh God, that you knock off the rough edges. It's it's you who who want what's best for us. Your loving kindness and tender mercy towards us. It prevents us uh, from falling into chaos. It, it, it keeps us out of out of the bowels of decadence. It's it's your wisdom and your guidance as a loving shepherd that keeps us from being disgraced. That keeps men from destroying our lives. God, it's your watch for eye as Jehovah Roi that walks us graciously throughout our day. And it is why we give our full attention to you this morning. It is why our heart is devoted to you this morning. Come hell or high water, we look for our King. Even when we can't trace you, God, I trust it's still intact. Even when we can't see you, we know you that we know that you are a God that saves. Our patience is for you. Our patience is in you. So we believe the word. Those that know their God. Those that know their God. Shall do great and mighty exploits. Our, our knowledge of you. We ask the Holy Spirit to deepen it. Our understanding of your ways, we ask the Holy Spirit to expound upon it. Because when we know you, there is nothing impossible in your will. When we know you, there is nothing that we cannot do with your help. For those that know their God, hallelujah, shall do great and mighty exploits. Those that know their God shall do great and shall do mighty exploits in the name of Jesus. So I thank you for everybody who's here this morning. Hallelujah. The covenant in the blood of Jesus. From the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Covered in the blood of Jesus. I thank you this morning that there is a wall of fire a hedge of protection around them according to Zechariah 2 and 5. For, for you shall send your angels to encamp about them, their home and their belongings. And the glory of God shall rest upon them in the midst of them in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, that you are their real work and you are their protector. You are the Lord of Savior their military God. A thousand shall fall at their, their left hand, ten thousand at their right, but it shall not come near them in the name of Jesus because we hollow the name of our God. You are a great and terrible God who deserves to be worshipped, who deserves to be reverenced, and we and we bring it before you this morning. We all, we open up our affections. We open up our emotions. And we open up our will before our great and mighty King this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It's our prayer. It's our call. It's our duty. It's our duty. And it is our honor. And it is our honor. Hallelujah. How many of you know? It's an honor. It's an honor to serve the king. It's an honor to serve the king. It is an honor. It is an honor to serve the king. It is an honor to labor alongside Jesus Christ. It is an honor to be in partnership with him as he ushers in the kingdom of God. It is an honor. Listen. Hallelujah. Listen before I share this passage of scripture with you. May God put on my heart for you this morning. Paul 
partnering with God is an honor. Sometimes what people think God does, I don't want to say it that way because I can't say everything that God does because I don't know everything that God does. Let me say it this way. Sometimes people think the only way that God does things with people is that he comes into their life. Oh, glory to God. And gives them instructions on what to do with their life. And then begins to walk them through their life. That's a part of the process. I know I'm not going to be able to articulate what God has given me revelation in my spirit about. But I'm going to do my best. You really want to partner with God. You want to accelerate your life in God. You want to restore all the years that were taken from you. You want that to happen? I want to tell you something really, really simple. Listen. Most people are looking for forgiveness when they mess up. And we should. But sometimes you can get stuck in the cycle of just walking in forgiveness with God. You should want forgiveness. But forgiveness is not it. That is not all. Forgiveness helps you get back on track but it does not give you progress. Let's say that again. God forgiving you is great. It puts you back in alignment with the will of God, but it does not progress you. It does not help to get back to things that you lost. I can be in a domestic violence relationship and my spouse was physically abusing me, took my money, took my cars, almost took my life. I lost everything and get to a place in their life where they truly sorry, they truly repented and come to me and say, you know what, I'm going to honor the divorce that you wanted because you rightfully should divorce me. I should have never married you. I've been cheating on you. I've done all types of stuff. I'm going to honor it. And I just ask for your forgiveness. Y'all follow me, please. I could forgive them. And I should because the believer walks in forgiveness. But just because I forgave the person who abused me, it does not mean that I get any of the stuff back that I lost. Her saying, forgive me, and me saying I forgive you does not get my car back. It does not get the money I lost back. It does not get the house that, that you took back. It doesn't get any of that back. So we need forgiveness, but don't confuse forgiveness with restoration. 
have the forgiveness, you must be restored. You must be restored. If my spouse then came to me and said, please forgive me for everything that I've done. I was wrong. And then they turn around and say, I'm going to buy you a new car. I'm going to buy you a new house. I'm going to put money in your bank account. That's restoration. That's restoration. And sometimes with God, we get confused. We get forgiveness confused with restoration. If you just keep walking in the forgiveness of God, doesn't mean it's going to get you anywhere in God. The forgiveness of God helps you with your peace. But the restoration of God helps you with your progress. Hallelujah. So when you mess up, when you get off track, one thing condemnation will most assuredly do is make sure you don't ever get restoration. Condemnation does not does not care about you getting forgiveness because forgiveness will let you feel good about yourself and feel good about your relationship with God, which you need. But time is a commodity that no human being can ever get back. But God can. Time is a commodity that no human being can ever recover. But God can. So while we're off track, while we're messing up, the clock is ticking on our moral life. Somebody stay with me this morning. I'm going to show you something. The clock is ticking. Even though God is forgiving me, even though God is helping me, even though God is, I'm back at peace. I've lost things and I've lost time, which I cannot recover. God has a mechanism in the kingdom of God. He has a spiritual advantage built into the kingdom of God called restoration now restoration is not just putting you back on track that's forgiveness hallelujah restoration is putting you where you were supposed to be before the time was lost that's restoration you ever seen an old vehicle before on the television show and it's an old 1956 Chevy and it's all beat up the paint is worn off it the tires are flat. You look at the inside of the, the vehicle. Like the, the leather strip is worn. Just years of mistreatment. Just years of natural degradation. There's a word called entropy. Entropy simply means if something lives long enough, it, it would eventually begin to deteriorate. It happened to this vehicle. And it's some show that comes on right there. They, were, they restore vehicles. And then, and then they'll, they'll show one clip of the vehicle. And they'll, they'll show another clip vehicle has been restored it's got its paint back it's got the interior back it's got the wheels back if you look at that vehicle you can't tell that it's ever been through anything if you look at that vehicle you can't tell that the paint was ever faded you can't tell that the tires were ever flat you can't tell that the leather was torn you can't see what the heat did to the inside of the vehicle. You can't see what the driver did to the engine and the transmission. It looks just like it came out of the shop in 1956. That's restoration. So when God says, I will restore all the years, that's what he's talking about. Hallelujah. Not just forgiving you. You have to have forgiveness first, but restoring you. So I went all the way back there to bring you to what I was trying to show you this morning. When God restores you, oh, listen, when God restores you, let me give you some revelation. When God restores you, 
don't just look to catch up and tell yourself, oh, I'm so far behind. And start trying to pick up the pieces of your past. That's fine. That's not where you start. Listen to me. That's not where you start. That's not where you start. That's not where you start. I'm not saying to not remember your past. I'm not saying that. There's things in your past that can help you with your present. Listen to me intently what I'm telling you. Paul says... I forget those things which are behind me. He's not talking about not having them in his memory. That's not what he's talking about. It's impossible to do that. This ain't the men in black. Oh, glory. That's not what he's saying. He said, I forget those things which are behind me. And I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you what Paul is saying. He said, the things that happened in my past, I'm not worried about those. Because those will keep me from pressing towards the mark. If I hang on to that, it will keep me from getting the prize that's in front of me. Hey, you with me so far? Here's the revelation. In the spirit realm, the Holy Spirit, which is governing this earth, Holy Ghost, why am I going this way this morning? In the spirit realm, the Holy Spirit is governing the earth. Listen, the Holy Spirit is not waiting for anybody. L listen, Costas, in the spirit realm, there is a flow. There is a stream of the advancement of the kingdom of God happening in the spirit realm. It's not waiting for any mortal human being. Hallelujah. For those of you who surfed or understand surfing, I'm from Florida, so this makes sense to me. It may not make sense to all of you. There is a wave in the spirit. And what a skilled surfer will do. What a skilled surfer will do. My son was asking me about surfing yesterday. He will see a wave coming. And right as that wave is coming, he will do what you call catch the wave. He doesn't go in the ocean trying to create his own wave. Just because he didn't catch the last one, or just because he fell off the last wave, he doesn't become discouraged. He grabs his board, he patiently waits in the water for the next wave to come. And then when it comes, he rides it. In the spirit realm, there is a wave, a constant wave. And the spirit is not waiting for anybody. The word of the Lord says, God is looking to and fro in the whole earth, looking for somebody to show himself strong in. What I won't do, God will find somebody else to do. What I refuse to do, God will find somebody else to do. Ask Saul. Mordecai told Esther, if you don't, if you don't do your part, don't you think for one second that God is not going to raise up a deliverer from another place? The move that stop. So when I get forgiveness, I can't wait to teach this in deliverance. When I get, when I get forgiveness. I don't go back and start trying to pick up the pieces of my past where I messed up, where I fell off. I don't go back and start rethinking all my mistakes and my transgressions and my mess ups. Your mind will naturally do that for you. That's not what I do. I go and find where the wave is moving and I jump in. I ask God 
God, where are you right now? For two weeks, I've been out of it. For two years, I've been out of it. But I know you're still moving. And this is what will happen. Because God has not stopped moving. Because of our disobedience. Because God has not stopped moving. Because of our rebellion. That wave is still going. Because the kingdom of God is still coming. His, let me tell you what real mercy is. What real grace is. While that, while that wave is moving. God's forgiveness will put you in a place to now catch that wave. And God will let you ride along with him wherever he is. And so the problem is, people will say, I know what you were doing. I know your history. I know your past. I know you weren't in school. I know you were in adultery. I know you were in fornication. I know you were in disbelief. I know you were doubting God. I know you was out the will of God. How are you here? How are you doing that? They don't understand restoration. It's not you. It's not. It's God not letting our mistakes and our past be the demise of our future. God will take you and place you right where he is and it will look like you lost nothing oh that's why a genuine authentic love for God is so important this is not for fakers God doesn't do it for fakers he's too intelligent for that this is not for people who don't trust and, uh, uh, and don't trust and have faith in him it does not happen that way but for those who are truly broken and looking for God to lead their life, this is exactly what will happen for you. Exactly what will happen for you. So then Paul brings us to Revelation in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good, for those that love God, those that are called according to his purpose. I tell you, Ecclesia, as I pray over you this morning, if your love for God is genuinely intact and unconditional love, I love him more than everything. And if you are seeking out your purpose, Romans 8 and 28 is your scripture. If it is, if, if, if we do not fulfill those two conditions, Romans 8 and 28 is not our scripture. But if we love God, if we are passionately pursuing while we are here on earth, whenever you fall, because Proverbs says a just man falls seven times but gets back up. If you fall, and you don't have to fall through huge sins, you can fall emotionally, you can fall spiritually. Just, just start doubting God, losing faith in God. If that's you, wherever God is, He'll grab you. you'll begin to ride with God again. This is mercy. <laughs> oh, that's mercy. That's mercy. That's mercy. God, I know what I deserve. After all I did, I know, I know what I should have. I shouldn't have this. I shouldn't be doing this. Don't you be condemned by your failures. If your love for God is intact, you're going to be just fine. Don't you be condemned by your setbacks. If you are pursuing your life in God, you're going to be fine. Hallelujah. That's why I am, me personally, I am more enamored by the mercy of God than the grace of God. Grace is giving me what I do not deserve, but mercy is not giving me what I do deserve. I deserve to be left behind. 
I don't deserve to have the life that I have. I know I don't. I don't deserve to know what I know. I don't deserve to have the wife I have. I don't deserve to have the children that I have. I'm mindful of that. I never ever come before God and say, God, this is well deserved. I may have earned it. That's a difference. But I don't deserve it. I may have put in the work to earn it. But I don't deserve it. There's many people who put in work. There's many people who labor that don't have what you have. Yes, there is. There's people right now with PhDs working at Circle K. I don't have nothing against Circle K, but their pedigree says they should not be in that environment. What's the difference between you and them with a GED and a high school diploma? Having the things that you have, having the children that you have, having the job that you have, going to the church that you go to. What's the difference? It's the mercy of God. Don't ever believe that it's anything more than that. It's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of Almighty Jesus Christ himself. You may have earned it, don't mean you deserved it. I know I don't deserve it because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No man seeketh after the Father with all his heart. No man. Unless that man is dead to himself and the Spirit of God is drawing him. That's the only way it happens. He has to die and the Holy Spirit has to live. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. This is why I love God so much. Because I, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. By all rights, by the, by the law of the earth, when the gun went off and the race started, I should be laps behind everybody else. But as they were running, and God saw fit in his mercy and his kindness, Sam will pick you up and put you right where everybody else is running. Uh, why does he do it? All I know, all I know is that his love is past finding out. Why does he do it? Romans chapter 9. They were questioning God about his decisions. And I love what God said. He said, this is how gratitude is built into your relationship. Listen to me. He said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I don't deserve it. If there's any acts of kindness, if there's any acts of of victory in your life, progress, meaning it's the mercy and the compassion of God and we did not choose it. There are some people who love God and die early. Love God and their spouse just walk away. Oh, but when the mercy of God, the compassion of God, Find your address. <laughs> oh, you think you, you, people think they're blessed? No, that's blessings. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. With the money you got in your bank account, how are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? They ain't gave you a raise in five years, but we can't tell. How come everybody died from COVID? That died from COVID besides us? We caught it. We caught it. We caught it. We were around it. Oh, you thought it was your immune system that was so strong. Oh, you thought it was the medicine and the, and the pills that you were taking. You thought it was the shot that you got. Thank God for all of the supplemental securities that we use in our life. But don't you be fooled into thinking that the mercy and the compassion of God was not the fundamental reason that we are sitting here looking at each other today. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. I trust in the name of the Lord. So I wanted to read this passage of scripture to you before I let you go this morning. 
because I believe in putting things in context. Those of you all know me, I'm a teacher. I apologize if I give understanding first. But that's just who I am. Romans 8, 31 through 39. Y'all allow me just for a second to indulge myself in reading multiple scriptures. I know we don't normally do that, but I love the word of God. And I like to bring meaning to what God has done. So Romans 8, 31 through 39. I want this to marinate in your spirit. Thank you, Nina. How much God really loves us. How deep are the depths of Jesus' love? What he did on Calvary's cross was for more than my salvation. That was the start. What he did on Calvary's cross was for more than just my forgiveness, but it was for my restoration. To restore to me. Restore to me everything that was lost. I was a sinner. Lost in my sin. But he restored me back to the Father's love. That was no small act. Bless his name. My Savior came and took my guilty plea. This is the love of God. I want to show you this moment. Don't you forget. I don't care what happened to you. I don't care what you did yesterday. I don't care where you come from, your neighborhood, your background, your past. I tell my church all the time, you are not from your mother. You are not from your neighborhood. You are not from your parents. You're not from your background. That's not where you're from. You came through your mother's womb. You came through your neighborhood. You came through your city. But who you are in God cannot be confined to a geographical location. You came through those people. You came through that place. You came through Samaria. But you are from the mind of God. Before you ever fall into your mother's womb, I gnosos you. I knew you. You came through those places. But you are not. You are not where you're from. You are not your parents. You are not your neighborhood. You just came through those places. But you came from God's mind. And God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, our imago day, our reflection, and let them have dominion over the sea and the, every fish of the fowl of the air. And let them replenish the earth. Let them multiply. Let them subdue and have dominion. That's where you from, the mind of God. Your parents were privileged to have you. Your parents were privileged to have you. And you are privileged to have your parents. Don't ever forget it. It was a privilege to work together in partnership to get you here. But that's not where you're from. Just like your parents are not from their parents. They came through their parents. I will never be bound. I will never be bound by the geogra geographical location of my birth. I will never ever be bound by my neighborhood of my city, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is global. The kingdom of God is global, and that's where you're from. I got off track. Let me get back. Romans 8, 31. I want you to see the love of God on full display. The love of Jesus on full display. What? I'm in King James. That's my favorite verse. What shall we say then? to these things. Ah, this is my sister pastor favorite scripture right here. If God be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the name of God. Listen, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? In other words, in other words, if, G if God gave Jesus because Jesus was necessary to fulfill all righteousness. His death as the sinless lamb was necessary to reclaim us back to the Father's love. If he did that, what makes what makes you think he won't pay help you pay your light bill? What makes you think he won't help keep your marriage together? 
That's what he's saying. Anyway, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Raise your hand wherever you are unless you drive it and say, I'm God's elect. I'm God's elect. It has nothing to do with my background or my skin color. I'm God's elect. I don't care if you agree, I'm God's elect. Thirst, verse 34, who is he that condemned? It is Christ that died. Who can, who can tell you what you, what you can and you can't do? Who can tell you who you're supposed to be? He says, who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Christ is the one that paid for your life. Not them, they can't tell you who you're supposed to be. They can guide you, they can instruct you, but they do not formulate your destiny. They do not perpetuate your purpose. It is Christ alone. Hallelujah. Who is he that condemned? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of the God, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Jesus is still serving. He's at the right hand of the, of the Father, telling the Father, oh, please help him, Father. God Almighty, bless Pastor Buller. Oh, God, help him in his marriage. Help him in his ministry. He's got my blood dripping all over him. He's got my blood dripping all over Help him, Lord. Help him, Father. Help him, Father. I died for him. That's what Jesus is doing for you and I. And the Spirit of, the, and, and the Spirit of God is working in coordination with the Father's will. That's John chapter 16. I would not, the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send you. He would not speak of himself, but only the things that I've already spoken to you. Glory to God. Verse 35. Y'all, these are my verses right here. I'm about to shout. These are my verses. When I saw this at 19, when I saw this at 19, it changed my life. It, it radically changed and shifted my life. I wasn't even living saved. But this became a revelation. When I found out that God really loved me, when he really loved me, condemnation went out the window. When I became a parent, it really became real. I love my babies. All three of my kids. Ain't nothing they can do that will stop me from loving them. Will I disapprove? Absolutely. Will I chase it? Absolutely. Will I correct? Absolutely. But never, ever, ever, ever stop loving them. And I am a human being. Verse 35. Who shall... You got to answer this question. What I'm about to read, you got to answer this question. Sooner or later, this question has to be settled in your heart. This is what I love about it. Uh, some of you are on here. I know some of you have already settled this question. Mother Gwen, who's on there, she settled this question. I know she has. There's some people you just know. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Then he's going to go through a litany of things that may not make sense in our English vernacular, but I help them make sense in the King James. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, that simply means when things get hard, or distress, that stressful things that come into our life, or persecution, that's haters, backbiters, or famine, that's COVID-19, or nakedness, that's our needs and wants, or peril, that's when people in, in, uh, in the season and the times that we're in bring opposition against our cause, or the sword, that's death. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, shall famine, shall nakedness, shall peril, shall sword? Don't mean those things aren't coming because they coming if you live on earth. But they don't sub they don't get in the way of God loving me. Mm, 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 mm. Verse 36, as it is written, if you are a believer in Christ, this is happening to you. If it ain't happening, it's coming. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. There's always somebody doing something to you 
always somebody got something to say about you. They got something to say about your God, your faith, your family, the way you look, the way you talk, the way you dress. If you are a follower of Christ, somebody's going to have a problem with you. There's somebody got a problem with me right now talking to you. I guarantee you. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But verse 37. Oh, if you got a Bible, if you still old school like me, I was born in the 80s. I got that hard text. I got a lap, I got a laptop in the pad, but I got this. If you got one of these, oh, I want you to highlight number verse 37. Because verse 37 is what I call a consolation scripture. That simply means when I've read all the bad news. Here comes the good news that cancels out everything that God just told me about. Verse 37 says, nay, nay. That means no, no. I don't care about all those things happening. No. And all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I conquer. Not because of my intellect, not because of my education, not because of my connection, not because of my geographical location, not because of my political connections. All of those things are fleeting and eventually will fail you. He said, no, I'm a conqueror because this thing I got settled in my heart. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible. It tells me so. But this ain't even the passage. Verse 38 and verse 39 is the passage. This is the conviction. Somebody type on the screen for me. Pastor, I am persuaded. Just type, I am persuaded. Verse 38 and verse 39. Paul says, now I got it. It don't matter what happened to me. It don't matter what come my way. Jesus loves me. It don't matter what they say about me. It don't matter what I say about myself. It don't matter when I get off track in my own thinking about myself. Jesus loves me. Paul uses a, a strong word here. A strong word. Listen to what Paul says. He says, for I am persuaded. That means you can't move me off of this. You can't talk me down off of this. I don't care what you preach. I don't care what the media says. I don't care what the president says. I don't care what my mother says. I'm persuaded. For I am persuaded. That neither death nor life, angels nor principalities, things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I'm persuaded. Death nor life, angels nor principalities, nor heights. Nothing, 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 nothing is going to come between me and my God. I pray in the name of Jesus that this grace to stay persuaded in the midst of trials, that it follow your life this morning in the name of Jesus. I pray that the grace for persuasion invades your personal space this morning in the name of Jesus. I pray that this grace for persuasion it rests on your faith this morning in the name of Jesus. I pray that in the middle of trials, in the middle of tribulations, in the middle of, middle of hardships, in the middle of doubt and wavering, this is grace for persuasion that it will captivate your imagination and the, that, it, that it, it, will, it will accentuate your walk with God, a persuasion that you walk in. I pray in the name of Jesus that you wear it like a garment. That your past can no longer victimize you from your future. Because there is a persuasion that the love of God restores you in the name of Jesus. I pray that this grace falls on your marriage. A persuasion that what God has put together, let no man put us under. I pray in the name of Jesus. There's grace for persuasion. If God gave you the prophecy, it will come to pass. If God gave you the promise... They're all yes and amen in Christ Jesus. A persuasion that God, according to Numbers 23 and 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he has to repent. Has he not said it? 
and shall it not come to pass. A persuasion that God loves you. God loves you past your insecurities. God loves you past your weaknesses. God loves you past your setbacks and your failures. You are not a product of your past, but you are a product of the priest of the Most High God, who is Jesus Christ Himself. All limitations, all barriers are dismantled by the power of God and the authority of Jesus Christ, by the integrity of Scripture, by the integrity of Scripture. If God be for you, who or what can be against you? In the name of Jesus. I pray this over your life this morning. I pray this over your life this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Tony Lee, there's no sickness. No sickness. No infirmity that can hold you down. None. 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 Pastor, it's still here. The problem is still here. The issue is still here. The concern is still here. The person is still here. You keep riding with God. You keep going with God. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for you. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. Don't let it bother you. You keep going. Pastor, the weakness is still here. You keep praying and you keep moving. Don't let it hold you hostage. Don't let it keep you still. Don't let it immobilize you. The grace of God is sufficient for you. And Paul says, therefore, where I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God's power will show up. God's power will show up when it's still there. God's power will show up when it's, the problem is, is still glaring. Listen, he'll cover you while you're working on it. He'll cover you while he's developing you. Sometimes God will leave it there as a part of the development process. But you trust in God. You keep going. I know everybody's laughing. They're looking. They see the issue. They see the problem. It looks like nothing is happening. They do not know that. Behind the scenes, God is working. God is working. I can't wait to teach this Sunday. Sometimes, sometimes when God is not speaking, it doesn't mean that he's not moving. Sometimes when God is not speaking, it's because he's going to set things up. If you tell me you need something and you send me to the store, you can't hear me talking anymore. If you tell me you need something and you send me to the store, you can't hear me talking anymore. Doesn't mean that I'm not doing anything. I'm going to the store to get what you asked for. And when I come back, I'll be talking again. When I come back, I'll be talking again. Hallelujah. God's delays are not his denials. Oh, glory. Let me get off of here. I feel my help. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the power of God wanting to arrest somebody this morning for you to believe again. For you to believe again. You used to be the most radical person in your circle. You used to be the most on fire person in your family. I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that the Spirit of God will relight your fire again. Relight your fire again. Leviticus 6 and verse 12 says, Never let the fire go out. Put wood on it daily set the, so that the lamp will stay lit in your temple. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Y'all be blessed. Listen, I see you back here tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Remember, God loves you with an everlasting love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.